What's poppin' me, gente? Your boy is back. Back with another video. Now, there are a lot of things I want to discuss in this video, so I'm going to get right to it. This video is mostly going to focus on setting up the camera to do your own 2D-style Castlevania game. There are other things I wanted to talk about, other things I wanted to show you guys, but we just don't have the time for it. This is my second time recording this video because the first time, drug on and on, it was about 45 minutes long. So, let's see if I can get it right this time. The first thing I'm going to talk about here is how this screen is set up because those of you who have never used Unity probably don't know what you're staring at right now. So, on the left is what's called the scene view. The scene view here is where I can edit things. I can move objects, I can paste objects in. This is basically where I do all my work. Okay, you see I just highlight that and moved it. Okay? This here is the game view on the right side. You can even see it says game up there. This is what you will see when the game is running and to show that I'll go ahead and hit play. While that's going on, on the bottom we have the animation window, which it does just what it says. It holds the animation for the current object we have selected, if any. On the right side we have the hierarchy, which is the objects that are in the aforementioned scene view. As you can see right here, I can click on them, like stairs 01, and if I hit F this side, you see it focuses in on it. Okay. The inspector has the details of the current item selected, and down here we have the project folder with the files in it. So, that's the basics. What you're going to want to focus on for the most part here is going to be the hierarchy and the inspector on the right side and the game view here. Because we're going to discuss, as mentioned previously, setting up the camera. So I'm going to skip a lot of the technical aspects of how cameras and views work, resolutions and things like that because we would be here forever. But it suffices to say that it can be very confusing when you're starting out in Unity because your first thought is, okay, let me just take this camera and let me shape it to what I need. Now, for those who don't know, do not know, Symphony of the Night screen is 256 by 208 pixels, and one of those rows of pixels is blacked out. So, depending on your view, it's either 256 by 207 or a row, a row of those pixels is blacked out. I don't remember why that is at the moment. It's not important. But why that matters is if we were to take the number 208 and divide it by 256, and I'm doing that off screen, we would get a result of 0.8125. If we divide 13 by 16, we get the same answer, 0.8125. So why is this relevant? Well, 16 to 13 aspect. You'll notice something, however. I'm going with the height first, which seems counterintuitive because all these aspects you see, they work like this, right? 16, 13, 4, 3, 16, 9, 16, 10, etc etc well the reason is when you're setting up a camera the height is what you go by so if you have a camera that is 256 by 128 it is a 2 to 1 ratio notice the wording 2 1 2 to 1 let's put it a better way because that's a bit confusing you have a view that is 1024 by 256 that is a 4 to 1 ratio 2 1 as in it's referring to the height okay the width is this perspective compared to the height now normally this might be a bit of an issue to get this to work within unity and I'll show you why right now I have a script on both cameras don't worry about the fact that it's two cameras an ortho camera in short is one where Z sorting and Z depth aren't taken into account and what I mean by this if I go ahead and hit play I right now have the mountains in the background okay they are set up with the orthographic camera, which is basically, a, I can call it a 2D camera for short. Let's go ahead and go to the mountains. And now, let's go ahead and change... Let's disable the script because it automatically moves it. I'll talk about parallax later in the video, but if we move it XYZ, you can see it moving a little bit. If we move it YYZ, you can see it moving a bit. However, if we move the Z, nothing happens except it disappears. It doesn't look like it moves, and the only reason it's disappearing is it's getting out of the camera view. Okay? If I rotate XYZ, you can still see that. If I rotate YYZ, you can still see it. And ZYZ, you can still see it. Same thing for the scaling. If I do X, you can clearly see it back there. If I do Y, you can clearly see it. Z, you see nothing, but again, if I was to go to 3D mode instead here, let's see if I can get this angle correct so I can show you guys what is going on. Keep in mind, this is a flat object. Okay, it is a 2D 
object. So it has no Z width. That's going to be irrelevant for the most part, okay? You see that there, everything's flat. So Z scaling is irrelevant here. The important part is going to be the Z positioning because with that, if you can adjust that, you can have something come at the screen and I'm going to show you what I mean right now because I'm going to change this. Instead of using the orthographic camera, which is what captures layer 3, I am going to go to tile layer 8, which is something the perspective camera catches. And now watch when I change the Z value. Look how it looks like it's coming at the screen. Let's go ahead and change this so you can see it better. Look how it's coming at the screen. And that looks realistic. It looks like it's coming right at you, right? Like, oh my god, we're about to slam into the mountains. And that is a feature you're going to probably want to have in a lot of modern 2D games because, for example, in Symphony of the Night, in the prologue stage, those clouds and what I could assume is the water on the bottom and also in the castle keep that are scrolling towards the camera, towards you, the viewer, that's how it's done, by chasing the Z value. Without a perspective camera, though, you can't do that. So... It is to your advantage, in my opinion, for something like this to have a perspective camera because it gives you access to more effects. The other thing is if you put in a true 3D object like this clock tower, the clock tower will move correctly and you don't need to use parallax scrolling on it. You don't need to worry about the angling and the movement and all that other good stuff that would otherwise be, well, a bit of a headache to deal with. And I'll show you what I mean here as we move upward. Look how the clock tower moves perfectly on its own and looks completely correct in 3D. Look at that. No more adjustments needed. On the other hand, you are also going to have 3D objects like the door in the castle entrance, for example, or the coffins during the battle with the fake Trevor, Grant, and Cypher that you want them to look like 2D objects, yet still be able to animate 3D so you can see them rotate on their side. The door at the castle entrance, for example, you see it slam shut. You see it go from horizontal to vertical, and you see that it has 3D. It's, 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 it has three dimensions to it. Same for the coffins I mentioned. Those are three-dimensional. But if you were to set these up with a perspective camera, then much like the clock tower, you would see angling, and it would look very funny. They would no longer look like flat objects facing the camera. So for some 3D objects, you will use an orthographic camera. But if you want true 3D, the perspective camera is what you want to go with. And it does 2D fine, as you can see. You can also use multiple cameras, so if you ever run into an issue where... Because Z positioning has a lot to do with what is captured on your camera. Like if I change the Z of... let's find something here. Let's go down to something simple. Let's go to the background image, because the background image is humongous, as you can see. Okay? I'm going to go ahead and just move the game system over here so it's directly over it, and you can observe what is going on while it is happening. The background image here is currently at a position of zero, along with all the parent objects. And the cameras, if I go ahead and put this back onto 3D mode, you can see where the cameras are. They are in front of it. Let's see what happens if I change the... and you can tell that if it's difficult. If it's difficult to tell, look at this box here. Okay, let me unhighlight that one, because they're both on top of each other. This box right here is the camera, and you can see the camera is over here and the background is right here and I can prove this to you because if I move it Z-wise, see how it's getting closer? That's how you know it's a perspective camera. If I was instead to change this to an orthographic camera right in front of you, see the difference? Distance then is irrelevant. Z distance is irrelevant to be completely, make sure I'm being completely clear because I know this can be a bit confusing to some of you and I get it so with a perspective camera you do have to take your Z sorting into account as well because I mean if you have things with different Z values you might get weird things like even with your sprite layer with your spriting layers for example your sorting layer on the sprite render is the best way to put it you might notice suddenly that wait a minute this item here has background something else has foreground yet the background is showing up in front of it and that could possibly be something to do with the Z sorting or also the shader you're using on your material. But the first thing you want to check is again this Z value. If something's not showing up in the camera, you want to again check the Z value and make sure that it is actually in front of the camera itself. Okay, I know that sounds like I'm talking to some people who are more experienced like they're idiots, but I promise that is not my intent. A lot of beginners don't realize this. Okay, this is in Unity. Unlike in something like Game Maker, this is an actual camera. It works like an actual camera. 
So you can't just consider it something like, okay, it's the screen. No, this is like a camera. On that note, I want you to notice I have a 1613 aspect going here. That is the original aspect of Symphony of the Night. If you want to capture all of the pixels in the game. Now, if you want to capture all of the image pixels in the game, excuse me, I don't remember at this point if there were some small black bars on the sides or the bottom. I believe there were some on the bottom here, but of course I'm taking those out because I want this to be a more full screen experience if there were. Again, memory doesn't serve me that well at the moment. It's been a little bit since I played the original and all I have is emulators here. And yeah, fuck all that. I actually just took a second and verified it. So yeah, this is there are no black bars on the original TV when you're playing the game. So the idea is, again, in short, it's a 16 by 13 aspect ratio on the original game. Now, right now, this looks like I have it just perfect, and I do, but let me uncheck a box and... Hmm, nothing seems to be happening, does it? Small movement there, but huh, what in the world is Esco doing then? This doesn't seem to matter. Esco must have lost his mind. Well, let's try changing the aspect to 16.9. Okay, now we've got a problem. More of the screen is being displayed than I want to be displayed. Let's try 16.10. Same thing. Hmm, well, that is an issue, isn't it? More of the screen is being shown. And here's why I say this is a bit of a headache for people. Um... This is what you're going to get without the camera scaling script that I have attached here. Don't worry, I'll go into detail on what it does and I'll show you the code. But you may notice on both cameras there are the same values here when it comes to scaling 1 to 1.23. Well, why in the nine circles of hell would Esco want to use 1.23 there? Well, remember when I said before the view was 256 times 208? What do you get? If you take 256 and divide it by that 208, you get 1.23. And again, our main reference is the Y value. If we look at the ortho camera, we have 104 sides, okay? So if you want a view that's 208 pixels tall, you need half that size. If you want a view that was 256, that would mean you'd need 128 pixels. You'd need 128 in the size here, which would result in 256 pixels. And now once you have your height figured out, then you need to know what's the width supposed to be. Well, in order to get that, what do we need? The height. And what do we need? The width. You take the width divided by the height. And you have 1.23 being your scale. But you notice this isn't working the way you'd anticipate it. Because you'd have to lock your aspect up here. And now once I do, notice if I'm going to click this again. Just to show you guys I'm not losing my mind here. Notice nothing changes. We have the correct aspect. But what's the problem with this? Well, obviously not everybody's going to want to play the game in 1613 aspect. And normally when you change the scale... Let me just go ahead and change it for you here. Notice nothing happened. Okay, let's go back to this aspect. Well, nothing's happening. Now, that is a problem, isn't it? Now let's put on the camera scaling. And there you go, you can see this actually does work properly. Okay? Now, to be clear here, you don't want to type in something like 1.23 because it won't be pixel perfect. You want to type 256 by 208. Sorry, the text is in the way, and then hit enter. And it'll give you the exact amount you want. Yes, you can actually type basic arithmetic operations in here. And Unity is smart enough to know, hey, give the result of that. See? Nice and simple. Okay, but the big thing here is you're going to need this. So let me go ahead and pull this up. And you guys are... This is not my script. It was originally made by a game named Namies on the answers.unity.com site. So again, if you're going to use this, credit him and I'll ask that you, since you got it from this video, put a link to my project. But this is the video that allows you to do that. See how simple it is? It's 56 lines. Allow me to close this so there's anything on the... Oops. Yeah, so if there's anything on the right, it is not obscured. And you can see for yourself, this is all there is to it, guys. If you need this script, again, pause the video. Feel free to type it out. I might even put up a link to it, if I remember, where you guys can download it in plain text format. And I just noticed, I don't think this is actually needed here. I don't think that's actually used because it's grayed out. Let's see if it gives me an error or something breaks, though. 
Let's give it a moment. Unity is deciding it wants to make me look bad because you're all watching. But that is basically what you need to get the camera exactly how you want it. To have yourself a nice 2D camera where, irrelevant of the aspect we pick, you are always going to have the correct view in play. And that is extraordinarily helpful because it will be, even if you pick different resolutions, you'll have the correct size in play. And that's important because for those of you who are struggling with creating a 2DS camera, this is why you need this script. Use it, it has next to no overhead, and it doesn't need any maintenance. You hit a tick box, you put it on each camera, and you are good to go. Again, don't let the fact that there's multiple cameras here throw you, okay? Now with the perspective camera, you'll notice we have something different. Field of view instead of the size. So the best way to do this is again, if you're going to put in a perspective camera like I recommended, select it as orthographic first, put in the height you want, and then just go back to perspective, you're done. You might need to make a small Z adjustment because obviously now there's, well, perspective here. And it takes Z sorting into effect, so you will need you gotta do is see if I put negative one, it captures the whole thing. Okay? But that's because it's orthographic. So if we go to perspective now. Oops, it's too close, but you know you have the correct field of view here. You could try messing with this some. You could try screwing around with it to get the exact value you need, but again, it's easier to just do it the way I said. I'm not trying to overcomplexify things here. And you can see the headache I'm already having trying to figure out, oh, well, what exactly, what value do we need there? Again, keep it simple. There are multiple ways to do this. And you will hear people tell you, oh, well, that's, you should do it this way instead. Those people are usually super geeks who are obsessed with optimizing everything they see and with it being their way right away, thinking life is Burger King when it is not. My point in saying that is, unless you are doing something that's burning up massive amounts of resources or is vastly inefficient to the extreme, there are multiple ways to do things when you're coding an engine. Don't worry about every little thing. This is fine. It's not hurting anything resource-wise whatsoever. Okay? If you have any questions on this, um, again, if you're a Patreon supporter, by all means, feel free to leave the question below. If this is on YouTube and you're not a patron, I'm sorry, but I rarely respond to YouTube comments, which is where you're going to be writing your response. So, again, become a Patreon supporter, and I'll be happy to offer some support on these videos because I understand some of this might still be confusing. And I know there's a lot more here but again all the rest of this you don't really need to worry about below camera scaling this script here and this is just the effects that I showed off in one of my previous videos and also if you downloaded my option screen well you can see there's the blur you can change the level via the option screen and also there is a new and improved CRT effect because I did get a complaint on the patreon page and then looked and noticed the person was right there are better CRT scan line options out there so I did upgrade the code. And again, I want to give a quick thank you to the person on the Unity forums who created the original code. And then he actually upgraded about a year or two ago and I didn't notice, so I'm using the new modified code, which I, of course, then edited and changed in some ways. So, but here are the new scan lines. I think they look a lot better now. Next up, I want to discuss something that I'm sure you guys have questions on. And that's called parallax scrolling. So what exactly is parallax scrolling? Well, I'm not going to go into a technical explanation, so some of you super nerds out there are about to get all, Ooh, let's go, and that's not technically right, you know, that's a very base explanation. Eh, well, suck my dick, motherfucker. Swallow what comes out, tell me it tastes like cookies and cream. This video is designed for laymen, normal people like me who might have gone to school with basic classes or just read up a lot and studied on their own like I did. Okay, it's not designed for those of you who are computer gods and programming gurus. If that's the case, why would you even be watching this video? I mean, seriously, it's obvious that I'm mid-level at best versus those of you who are probably gods at this. This is so one-on-one to you. You're obviously here to just troll, so fuck off. For the rest of you normal people like myself, here's a layman's explanation. It's basically a special effect that makes things that are supposed to appear further from the camera, like background objects like the moon, the cloud, the mountains here, and it makes them look like they're moving at a different speed versus things like these foreground tiles or even these little background tiles here that are supposed to be closer to the camera. And that's all there is to it. You will see a lot of places where they make parallax scrolling sound like, oh my god, it is so advanced, it is so difficult, you have no idea the type of work you're going to have to put into it or the setup bullshit. This is the script right here. You can ignore 
anything under a mount to rotate, and you can ignore disable angle. Disable move, all it does is say, do we apply parallax scrolling to this? It's akin to disabling and re-enabling the script. It's just used for debugging purposes. So if I disable it right now on the mountains, disable the move, take the player tester object, which is this pink square if it wasn't already clear. Notice the mountains are now no longer have the parallax. The water does though, so it's coming in front of it. But that's it. That's just for testing purposes. Very handy when you're trying to debug, I'll say that. All you need to pay attention to though is basically the speed and the cam start position. And I'm sure there are those of you right now who are thinking, damn, I'm sure this is advanced to hell to code, even though you're saying it isn't, man. Oh, how am I going to figure this out? Well, that's easy. I'm going to show you the script. So you can feel free to rip it off. Again, all I ask is give me some credit. Also post a link to the Patreon page. That's all I ask. But feel free to use this code. Again, the only things you're really going to need here are initial position, the speed, the cam start position, and that's it. Everything else is optional stuff. So if you don't see it involving that, Oh, and main cam, of course. You do need that because that stores where the camera is. And again, I'm going to say it one last time. If it doesn't involve those variables, you can feel free to cut it out and your script will work fine. But here it is. We have a late update that runs everything, so it makes sure that we have time to move the player first before, or the object the camera is following, whatever the case may be, whatever you have it set to follow, before you actually tell the camera, hey, go move into position for this. This way it's not all jittery and instead it's nice and smooth. Very simple there. And the move object, all it does is what you would think it would do. It modifies the position by changing the transforms X and Y values. Set X2 and set Y2 are just extensions I came up with that are shortcuts. So instead of having to type out transform.position equals new vector 3 and then put this in, followed by comma transform.position.y, comma transform.position dot z and having it all the way out to here it's nice short sweet concise if you want to see that extension method it's pretty one on one level here it is not much to it no you can't just do the normal thing some people are thinking of oh let me just go ahead in and do transform dot position dot x equals notice you get an error there and that's all there is to it guys so this is a simple way of moving around the camera. The big part is, again, make sure you put this code in late update. If you're going to have a ton of objects, you're not sure which one you're going to be following in particular because you want to make sure their movement's going to be more than likely in fixed update if you're doing it manually to the transform or even if you're using a rigid body 2D. You want to make sure a late update so it takes place after the object you're following has moved and you don't get a bunch of jitteriness. That's all there is to it, guys. Again, don't be intimidated by this. A lot of people hear, oh, parallax, you know, that sounds like a very advanced topic. It's not. As you can see, it's one on one level. You will want to attach this to the object you want to have the parallax scrolling. And then it will automatically find the camera. You could also just drag and drop it in. If you wanted to make this a serialize this field as well, we could simply go over here and drag and drop in the camera right here if you don't want to use the find but again that should happen once when you first start the stage and that's it on a related note because I never actually mentioned how to get the camera to follow things that's the next thing we're going to talk about all right so camera movement the first thing you guys are probably going to notice is on both of these cameras there are no scripts for movement well those of you who know a little bit about unity probably notice this parent object up here they're both attached to and yes there is something else under the main camera here but that's just graphics pay no mind to that okay so they're both attached to the game system because I want both of these cameras to always align there's never going to be a time where I'm going to want the background to be in a different position than the foreground see well I could theoretically create some neat effects with that at some point I don't see myself using it and if I do there are ways around this but I digress the bottom line is the game system parent objects will move them and looky here, here's the cam movement script. This is just when I'm changing rooms. Obviously if you're playing the game it's going to go in a certain order and even if it doesn't the room number can be set via code easily. But this is for debugging purposes so when I go to a new room the camera will automatically know what limits to look for using something called a scriptable object. What exactly is a scriptable object? Well, in short, it's something people tend to use like an XML file and that it contains a lot of data. You can set up a template and then you can go ahead and just make other objects derived from it. 
that will carry the data you need. You can make several iterations of it. Let me go ahead and show you what I'm exactly talking about because I know that's probably not the easiest thing to picture. And here we go. Notice it says scriptable objects, room cam limit, and we're going to create an asset menu so we can simply go back into the inspector, right click anywhere, create scriptable objects, room cam limits. Now I'm not going to create one because I already have one. There's no need to create another one. So we're going to go here and notice prologue room cam limits. All we have is three variables that are arrays and the reason is each of these arrays holds the value for a different room. So the minimum x, max x for room 0 is in slot 0. Same for the minimum y and max y and that's the max position the camera is going to go to in that room assuming it's not locked by an object because you can also put objects in that will limit the view at certain points and I'll discuss that in a moment. But right now we obviously don't want to go past the bottom here, the top, past a certain point or too far right or too far left for this particular room. Okay? And yes, individual rooms are individual scenes which makes it a lot easier. That means in every scene, if I was to go to another scene right now, you will all see the same setup with a room parent, a game system, and a camera, although there'll be one instead of two in that next room because I don't need two in that one. But this script will be there as well. And this script here, all it has to do when it loads the next scene or room, whatever you want to call it, is reference this array and go, okay, here's the limits of my camera and I'm good to go. So trust me, use a scriptable object here. You can use one per stage, I would say, because although these rooms are in different scenes, I can then make another scene that has all of the individual scenes for each room dragged into it and that will be the prologue and you don't waste any resources like that that's very minimalistic while still being set up in a way that hey if I need to go back and correct something it is a simple enough manner to go back into room zero and edit it without worrying about accidentally damaging something in room one or room two in the process whatever the case may be see what I mean this is completely isolated when I'm editing and look how clean and concise this is anything I edit in here I know is going to be in this room and I don't have to worry about whoops I drug something off screen somewhere now I have to go hunt it down nice simple that's just another tip I want to throw in for those of you who are designing a level the developers of Hollow Knight seem to have done it like this as well because their rooms were quite expansive they did each room into a scene and that doesn't hurt anything at all it's actually a pretty efficient idea that I got from them credit where credit is due you can see the object it's currently following is the player tester. So if I hit play right now, I'm going to move the player tester. You're going to notice he's not going to go too far to the right or too far. The camera, rather, excuse me, isn't going to go too far to the right or too far down because of those room limits. See, it doesn't follow him anymore. See that? And we go up, it stops at a certain point, and the same thing if I go to the left. That's what those room cam limits are for. But I don't have to use this object. I can take this right now, and instead, let's make it follow, oh, I don't know, one of these big candelabras. See how it jumped right over to it? It jumped immediately over to the object. Okay? And now it's following it. Now, this can be very useful if you want to do something like scrolling the screen automatically. Once the player crosses a certain line, you can create an invisible object and just automatically have that object move and now your screen is auto-scrolling. There's actually a lot you could do there, but I'll leave it to you guys to experiment. And you can see the scriptable object is right here. This here is just so we have a bit of a dead zone around the character. If I put a dead zone around 15 pixels, the camera will not move within that dead zone of 15 pixels left and 15 pixels right of the player. Normally what will happen is as soon as the player moves, it automatically follows him. If it's within limits, the script snaps it back into position, and you never get to see that happen, of course. But this is why the view looks, well, it would look so smooth if I could move it without the mouse. With the mouse, it looks a little jittery because I'm constantly moving it around here. But I promise that is because of me using the mouse. But you see has a bit of a dead zone around the character. He moves a little left, a little right, and it doesn't move with that in there. Versus if I was to set this back to zero, as soon as I move him now, even a pixel, even the slightest bit, it's moving with him. So that's what that does. Offset creates a kind of dead zone. Disable X and disable Y does exactly what it sounds. It makes it so that you won't have any more movement up or down on the left and right or up and down on this camera object or on the object this script is attached to is a better way to, correct way to word it. So now if I move 
up and down, see the camera's locked, and that's very useful because in this corridor in the original game, it locks here. So you can't go up and down. It isn't until you step back out here that it unlocks. That is extremely useful. X and Y limits is so that if we want to go past the limits we've set in that scriptable object, let's say you suddenly want to open up a new area that was all screen and hidden before, here you go. Notice the limit isn't there anymore. It's going past the screen limits we've set and now it isn't. Nice and simple. Lock X value and lock Y value are simply so that if you, again, like in that upper area, want to lock the view so it can't go past a certain position, you can do that as well without affecting the original screen room limits for the screen you set up. That's in a nutshell. Just think of it as we want to limit the view a little more besides what's already there. So let's say if I have the camera right now at its default locked amounts, which is right here. It can't go any further than where it currently is. Let's go ahead and try moving the player character some and make sure we're at the stream limit. Yep, the values I put in, you can see them right there. 736 minus 259. 736 minus 259, excuse me, minus 259. It's the minimum Y, which is the bottom, the max Y be the top, max X on the right, min X on the left. Don't let that confuse you. Again, I know this can be a bit confusing to wrap your head around. Just consider this. The topmost value is going to be for X is going to be on the right and for Y is on top. Just like when you look at a regular graph in school. Now, let's go ahead and see what happens if I change this value from the current value for, let's go with X's max is 736. So let's change it to 728 instead and see what happens. Now let's change it to 718. Notice how it's moving over a bit because the camera's being told now, okay, the limit's changed. And this is very useful because you can have an object in the screen that your character touches and says, limit the view right here, just in this small space. And it can just be a big, Let's say a big cube like the player object right now, except maybe it's transparent. Okay, when you're editing, if you're worrying about it showing it, let me just show you what I'm talking about better yet. Let me make a duplicate of the player tester object. Let's go ahead and just, we can leave everything as is, doesn't matter. Change the name. Limiter. Change the transparency to 64, so barely visible. Move it away from the player some. And let's expand it to something like, I don't know, 10 by 10. Now that can be a bit annoying to look at, so right here you see this, how there's two icons, the eye will hide this object in scene view, okay, so it's not in your way. Game view it'll still show up, but a simple way to do that is just to set your camera to not draw this layer, and problem solved. Now something I do want to caution you guys about, even though you can't see this thing anymore, it's still there. As you can, Let me click around a little bit, and let's see if I can manage to pick it by accident. I have a lot in the way here. That clock tower in particular, so let's just get that out of the way first. How odd. Hmm. Even though it's invisible, I should still be able to pick it. That's weird. But whatever. I was going to say, normally, if you don't want to be able to pick something in here, you just click that and well, now you won't be able to pick it, but it looks like when it's invisible, you can't pick it anyway, so... Okay, if you want it visible, but not able to pick it, because let's say you're trying to click something else in the background, just tick that little hand right there. If you want it totally gone and you don't want to see the damn thing, just do that. Nice and simple. Keep that little tip in mind, guys, because believe me when I say, it is vastly helpful knowing that when you're first starting off and editing things here. And as you can see, I even have a value that says it's not locked. Can't use zero here. Can't use negative one because any one of those could be a lock value depending on what room you're in and what area. So I just pick a number that I know is never going to be used and is very specific. Move lerp and movement speed. This is just, move lerp is set by the camera itself. I'll show you in a moment. The camera's script itself. Or I should say the camera movement script itself because this is technically not attached to the camera. It's attached to the parent object of the cameras. Sorry. So. This is basically just used to count by the script itself how far along we are between the position of the object being followed and the position of the camera. And this is just the movement speed. You can play with that. At this point, let's go ahead and just take a look at the script. You guys can see the code. And again, you're more than welcome to use it if you guys would like to. 
And that's it. I'm not going to go through what everything here does. If you're not sure, copy the code, play with it some. But you really shouldn't need to tweak this much. If you're going for a 2D camera to follow an object, this should do most of what you do. And it should give you most of what you need. And I didn't have to use anything fancy like Cinemachine and bother learning that. I created my own thing that I think works just fine. As you can see, I have it even set to by default find the player, but I may change that later because you can always just drag and drop it in. But it's considering the fact that every room has its own cameras, and that doesn't affect anything because as you walk into a new room, a new scene, the objects from the old scene are disabled. So they don't affect anything and the new scene's objects are activated. And that is again why we have this hierarchy like this, because just by doing this, I've now disabled everything in the room. This room is not consuming resources. Problem solved. Fixed update is used because we want to make sure that there is smooth movement. If you put this in update, you can use time dot delta time times your speed. But I just found it easier to manually alter the transform. It's very simple. This again is just lurping is, as you'll see down here, is just to make it so that the camera moves into position gradually when it's separated from the player's position. And that's very helpful in something like, let's say if you have an area locked off so it can't scroll vertically, once you go past that point, the camera has to catch up so now that, okay, vertically it's now centered over the player character or whatever object it's following, this will do it gradually so it doesn't snap into place automatically. Like you'll notice when I changed what it was following, it snapped into place automatically. That's what would happen without this here when it comes to movement if the camera's view was limited and then changed to another value. So we use that here to just make it a smoother transition, more gradual. And we only need it to check on the left and the right because we have a dead zone on each. Otherwise, this could be concise into one statement with a does not equal sign, and that'd be it. Why movement is no different. Literally, there is no difference. I'm actually looking at concising this script because I'm sure I can cut this down from two methods into one. But for testing purposes, I just did a copy and paste. And enforce X and Y limits. Nice and simple here. Again, I'm sure I can cut this down to be just half this amount of code. It's not finalized just yet. But if you guys want to feel free to edit it yourselves, knock yourself out, play with it, etc. For your purposes, this will work just fine. It's not wasting any resources. It's good as is, honestly. I could leave it this way and it would be just fine. Okay, so keep in mind, again, we are using a scriptable object here, which is room cam limits. See it right here? That is the main scriptable objects that all others derive from. So you need to make sure you set that here because then you're going to just drag the scriptable object in here so that for each room, we know what the limits are and it's on a simple chart. Now you could not use that. You could also put in an array directly in here and then just modify that. But keep in mind then if you're creating every room as a scene, that means every time you have to remember to create a prefab and drag it in. It's just another way of doing it, but I recommend the scriptable logic because, again, create the prefab with the scriptable object dragged in, and here's the best part. If you want to change it, just go right here to your little chart. It's separated from everything else and change it. If you want to go the script way, you could do the same thing. Again, put in a prefab down here with it attached. You have your array full of values. Edit it, and then just save your prefab. The problem there is if you do that, you're going to want to make sure you have a prefab for each area where the values are going to change. And that, I think, is a little harder to remember. Versus just, okay, put the script on. We have a note here. Set me when making new rooms. Drag in the scriptable object. Done. And that's it. Nice and simple. And it takes you a moment to do that each time. But again, either way will work. It's all up to you. Which way do you think is easier for you? Which way do you think is better for you? Which way will be more intuitive? Don't be afraid to experiment. And again, there's a lot of you out there who might be brand new to coding. You can do this. Just gotta keep trying. This is gonna sound funny, but if you need to, get a 4Dummies book. Look up 4Dummies videos. I'm not saying that to be condescending. That series of books and videos is amazing. It puts it in layman's terms versus using lots of shop talks that a lot of you wouldn't understand. If I, for example, walked in here and asked you, hey, what's the difference between a function and a method? Most of you would go, I, I, what do they, I, I mean, I don't know, what do they do? Well, there is no difference. They're synonymous for each other. But if I was to ask you about a variable versus a class, those are very different, okay? But that's what we call shop talk. Again, you can do this. Don't be frustrated. Start simple. 
learn, watch some videos, take stuff like what I have, experiment, fuck around with it, break the damn thing in half. Bend it over your knee, spank it, and make it call you daddy. Whatever you want to do, just don't be afraid to dive in and try over and over. The only difference between a master and a student is the master has tried more times than the student has even failed. Excuse me. Is that I got that totally backwards, so, whew, no Zen points for me today. What I meant to say was the difference between a master. The only difference between a master and a student is the master has failed more times than the student has even tried. And with that, that's it for this video. I think my next video is going to talk about... Maybe I'm going to show you a couple of hierarchies and what's involved in creating some of these objects. Even something as simple as, I think I'll use for an example, the prologue over here where you have this block in front of the switch, and then you have the switch, and then you have the ceiling hatch, and then you have the staircase. I think I'm going to show you guys what exactly is involved in something like that, because I'm sure everybody right now is shrugging and going, Oh, well, that sounds like nothing. It sounds like it's a total joke to take two minutes to do. Wrong. It's a lot more involved than a lot of you can probably picture. Just looking here at the hierarchy, I'm not even going to expand it fully. You can get the idea that what looks like it'd be a simple thing that involves one, two, three objects is not, and involves, well, quite a bit of things, and animation, sound files, and scripting. But I'll discuss that next time. I really want to show you guys what goes into things here. Along with possibly one or more things like whether you want to disable the object you spawn or destroy them, what's the difference between doing those two things and when you'd want to do each one. But as I say always, if you have questions, comments, join my Patreon page, leave them there. You're more than welcome to comment on YouTube, but I don't read YouTube comments. It's a one in a million when I check it, and the people that do check it for me are usually going to ask very basic stuff like if you say you're a spider, show me a link to your page, how do I contact you, and that's it. Okay? I'm not directly going to respond. I don't have the time to look through YouTube comments. I'm sorry. I appreciate all the support, but I just can't do it. There'll also be a link to the PayPal donation page. The PayPal donation link will be below along with the link to the Patreon page. And I'll also, as usual, put a link to the forums and the Facebook group. The forums right now are pretty quiet, other than if you have a bug with the option screen demo I released about a month ago, that's where you would put it. But right now it's quiet because I have not released anything playable gameplay wise yet the best place to go if you want to talk to people is the facebook group everybody's more than welcome there all right so that's it i hope you guys enjoyed this video i hope i didn't stutter too much i hope i wasn't too redundant and to all of you super nerds out there that's any i'm gonna write him a nice long letter because i think this is the best way to do this and i think he could save maybe 1k here in ram and you want to make a space to i have a special message for you and here it is fuck off Enough said, and I think that speaks for itself. Later.